Good morning and welcome to Medina First United Methodist Church. My name is Jeremiah Cavett. I'm the music minister here at the church and it's just so grateful that you could join us this morning as we worship God together. Uh, as we start, just a reminder that next week we'll be having service and we'll hear more about that. We'll have a service here in the building and so we'll hear more about that a little bit later. But also as we worship this morning, if you have a joy or a concern you would like to share with us, simply drop that in the message section or the chat box. Uh, for the service, and we'll lift those up at the end of service today. Or you can also call the office at any time and speak to Allison or Stephen, and then we'll get you on the prayer team. But we're so grateful that you've taken the time out this Sunday morning to celebrate and worship God with us. As we start this morning, we're going to sing, How Can I Keep From Singing Your Name? The words are on the screen behind us. can sing in the troubled times, sing when I win, I can sing when I lose my step and I fall down again, I can sing cause you pick me up, sing cause you're there, I can sing cause you hear me Lord when I call to you in prayer, I can sing with my life. Sing for I know that I sing with the angels and the saints around the throne. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing.
This morning, again, we're grateful that you've gathered with us on this Sunday morning online. And again, we'll be meeting next week in person. Uh, the procedure will be fairly simple. Um, by Thursday, you'll be getting RSVP. You'll, you'll get your slot where you'll be sitting when you come to worship on uh, next Sunday morning for either the first or the second service. You'll have an usher that will help you, guide you to your seat. And what we've kind of be like a seating in a movie theater that they do now, the new, the new movie theaters where you have your own assigned seat. That's the way it'll be here, and we'll try to work around if we, if we have those who aren't going to be here uh, or who haven't signed up who plan on being here. We hope you do sign up, and if you just show up, we'll make it work, okay? But next Sunday, it'll pretty be, we hope it will be pretty much of a seamless process. So if you'll come just a little bit early, I know that's asking a lot at the 8 o'clock service, uh, but at the 815 service, we hope you to get here about 8 o'clock, begin to filter in, and we'll plan on really starting the service. We may, may need some music to kind of act as a prelude before then, however you want to handle that with uh, Buddy and Will and Marley and uh, our, our, uh, our drummer. We'll take care of that. We'll try to get started uh, soon after 815, but give us a, a little bit of time there to get everybody seated. So we look forward to seeing you uh, next week. And hopefully it will be a, uh, be a learning curve for us, but hopefully it will go as smoothly as possible. Our scripture lesson as we begin our worship service today comes from Genesis, the 18th chapter, verses 1, and, 1 through 5 and 9 through 14. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. As he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, he looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I've grown old, and my husband is old, shall I have this pleasure? The Lord said to Abram, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will turn to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. Would you pray with me? Almighty and everlasting Father, as we come before you, who in every season of our life has the ability to heal, to restore, and to redeem, we gather before you this morning asking that we might be like the early patriarch Abraham and the matriarch Sarah and that we may greet your promise with hope and receive the joy of a new season by the power of your Holy Spirit. Bless us, Lord, as we worship you that that new season may begin within our hearts. We give you thanks and praise in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you now, if you're here with us, to join us for the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. You'll see it on the screens behind me if you're online. If you'll stand with me if you're at home and comfortable, let's stand today. Get a little exercise as we join together in worship. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Lord, I come. I come. 
confess Bowing here I find my rest Without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Lord, I live Grace is found, is where you are, where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me. Next song this morning is Eye of the Storm. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. And in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me. In the eye of the storm When the solid ground is falling out From underneath my feet Between the black skies and my red eyes I can barely see When I realize I've been sold out By my friends and my family I can feel the rain remind in me in the eye of the storm you remain in control in the middle of the war you guard my soul you alone are the anchor when my sails are torn your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm when my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith I see the future I picture 
slowly fade away when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face i find my peace in jesus name in the eye of the storm you remain in control in the middle of the war you guard my soul you alone are the anchor when my sails are torn your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm When the test comes in and the doctor says I've only got a few months left, it's like a bitter pill I'm swallowing. I can barely take a breath. And when addiction steals my baby girl and there's nothing I can do, my only hope is a trust in you. I trust you, Lord, in the eye of the storm. You remain in control in the middle of the war. You guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. You remain in control in the middle of the war. You guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. Amen. We have a Jesus, a God, a Savior who can keep his hand upon us in the middle of any storm. And we know that love will continue to hold us together, which is our next song. They don't have a job They don't pay your bills they Won't buy you a home In Beverly Hills Won't fix your life Any law of the land or the government, but it's all you need, and love will hold us together, make us a shelter to weather the storm. Knocking at your door In the moment of truth When your heart hits the floor And you're on your knees And love will hold us together Make us a shelter to weather the storm and I'll be my brother's keeper So the whole world will know that we're not alone This is the first day of the rest of your life This is the first day of the rest of your life Cause even in the dark you can still see the light It's gonna be alright be 
This morning, as we turn our attention to our time of prayer, we do have a few prayer requests that have been communicated to me um, over the last few days. Carrie Ann Parrish will be having her thyroid removed tomorrow, I believe is the day of the surgery. So we remember Carrie Ann and our prayers and her family. Also, uh, I spoke through text this morning to Donna Steins and her family, really to Donna in particular, but um, vicariously to the family. Um, they're on their way to um, Pittsburgh for Drew's appointment. They were in Dallas when I spoke to them. And so let's pray for um, good news for Drew as he continues um, the road and journey that he's taking with uh, problems with his liver. So let's continue uh, to ask blessings on that family. I also want to remember a family friend of ours, uh, my family and I, uh, Wendell Allen, who was a bus driver here in the community for years. Uh, he does have cancer, I think prostate cancer and also bone cancer. We want to remember him in our prayers. And a friend of mine, Melissa Newman, who has um, an aggressive form of breast cancer, though, in the very early stages. So remember Melissa. Uh, she lives in North Carolina. And our, our community home, Brooke Driggers, as she continues to undergo treatment for her breast cancer. And she, I think she continues to do well, so we continue to pray. That continues to be her trajectory in her path of healing. Also, uh, is it okay, Belinda, if I mention... Okay. All right. Okay. So I want to remember Charles Taylor, which is Belinda's brother, and uh, it's not doing well. He's in the hospital. So definitely want to uh, remember him in our prayers. And if you do send me a request, um, please let me know it's okay to share publicly because if you don't, I won't. I'll assume that it's supposed to be, to be held privately, okay? Let's also remember um, the Daniel family, friends with our piano player Chanda. As many of us know, um, family was in, uh, uh, experienced a horrific loss in one of their daughters. And um, Kristen is still in recovery. So remember Kristen in our prayers. All right. Let's bow together for our morning prayer to be followed by the Lord's Prayer, prayed in unison. Almighty and everlasting Father, as we gather before you, we do so mindful of the many blessings that you have given us. Lord, our songs of praise are only the beginning of the gratitude that we have for you and for all that you do for us. We're grateful for the blessing of this day, the gift of moments together again to live in your presence on this earth. The gift that you've given us in our families and friends who who draw us near to worship you. We give you thanks, Lord, even for the gift of our trials and tribulation. For we know indeed that you draw closer to us when our burdens are heavy. Today, Lord, there are many within our midst that we've mentioned and many others within our church and community who are in need of your encouragement and of your strength. Lord, we look around us and uh, our communities, Lord, are in need of your strength and of your healing. Our nation, Lord, every nation of the world 
And Father, we pray in, in the midst of a, a season of change, a season that can be discouraging, that you would give us eyes of faith, Lord, to see your work, to trust in your faithfulness, and to receive, Lord, all that you have promised for us through your Son, Jesus. We ask for healing upon those who are sick. We pray your healing upon those who have cancer. We pray you do a mighty work within the lives of all those who are hospitalized, those in nursing homes who are separated from loved ones, those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Speak to them the truth of life eternal and give them the comfort and peace that passes all understanding. And Father, for every family, Lord, we pray your blessings that we may truly worship you and honor you with all that we do. And with the family that is this nation, Lord, as we struggle with division, we pray that we may know your unity, the unity of divine truth through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you would heal our streets, you would heal our brokenness, and that you would help us to be healing agents for the world. Lord, we pray your blessings upon all those who give us protection and safety in our times of need. We pray for our police officers. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them and strengthen them. We pray your richest blessings upon our firefighters, our paramedics, our EMTs, all of our armed service personnel, Lord, those who serve in this land and those who are serving abroad to protect the interest of freedom. We pray that you'd lift them up, protect them, and bless them. And Father, we, we pray for all those within our world who would consider their neighbors around them enemies, even nations who would become enemies, Lord. We pray the promise of Scripture would soon be fulfilled, that all of us, Lord, would break our swords and beat them into plowshares. Help us, Lord, indeed, in this season to be one as you were one. And Father, now we ask that you would hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's good to have a few of our family here with us today. Yeah, they're preparing, uh, breaking us back into seeing live uh, uh, um, people with us instead of posters. We appreciate the posters. It might be a terrifying experience to see a, a church filled with people, right? Uh, I hope not. I'm excited. I hope you're excited to be back with us in person this week. And please, again, if you don't feel comfortable coming to worship, we understand that. We will continue to provide online services. We'll continue to pray for you, and you're still part of our family. So if you need anything from us, please let us know in the church office, and we'll make sure that is, that is taken care of to the best of our ability. We'll continue in our series that's uh, been most of the year, uh, Built on the Rock. And this morning, I want us uh, to begin thinking about this within the context of Matthew chapter 9, verses 35, going through Matthew the 10th chapter, verse 8. This is a passage of Scripture that uh, will be familiar to many of you as part of Jesus' uh, teaching that we should ask the Lord of the harvest to send out those to go into the fields and work, and also His calling of the twelve disciples, or rather the naming of them, and his commissioning of them to go into the world, their first commission, to go into the world and do his work. Matthew, the ninth chapter, verses 35 through 38. Since you stood up for the Apostles' Creed, I'm going to let you relax for the gospel lesson. But next week, have your standing, your standing pants on, okay? All right? You can wear shorts as long as they're appropriate, correct? All right. Matthew, the ninth chapter, beginning in verse 35. Then Jesus went out about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them 
because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, also known as Peter, and then his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. You receive without payment. Give without payment. Thus endeth the reading, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come as the light and reveal. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the wind and cleanse. Convict, convert, consecrate until we are wholly thine. Amen. This morning I want us to think on the subject as we think about our foundations of the Christian faith from the edges Nothing too wonderful. Some of you are perhaps old enough to remember one of the great pleasures that sometimes happened on the weekends when you were an adolescent. I remember them well back in the early to mid-80s before everyone had their own VCR or beta player. He would actually race and hope. I would pray my father would get home from the bank in time to take me to, to the little video store so that we could not only get a video, but we could get our own VCR to rent or beta player. Anybody remember that? It was a thrill. And if you got there too late, it was almost like your weekend was just burnt, you know. It was wasted. What a joy it was to be able to watch a movie, to watch it twice, to watch something with no commercials. I mean, it was like having your own movie theater at your house. Even if your television screen was only about that large, it didn't matter. It was wonderful. When I was a kid and got that thrill in my life, one of the most uh, important days to me to have that blessing was on my birthday. Because I grew up and just enamored with David Crockett. And so when I was a kid... It was a great thrill on my birthday to go be able to rent a VCR or a beta player, usually a VCR for us, and get to rent David Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier, the 1955 movie from Disney. I probably still can quote every word in the movie. I loved him so much and was uh, 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 thought so much of him that, that many times um, I just w- was in that zone the all the time. I mean, when I was at school, I was thinking about David Crockett. I remember in kindergarten, when you had craft time, I, I would paste three or four, probably four pieces of paper together, color them brown, then cut out a bear skin. I mean, I was into it, right? I was into it. I was so into it that my parents um, went to great lengths to have me enjoy that. And uh, one Christmas, when I was probably five or six years old, I got a leather jacket that had fringe on it, like David Crockett. Boy, I was something. I was something. There it is, the very Christmas. Can you imagine that? Just imagine the thrill that I had. Now, that's not a real rifle, in case you wonder. And it wasn't loaded. Not in the house. And I'm not shooting a gun in here either, so I just want you to know that. That was just sound effects. There's another one. We have no idea what's causing that, but we're working on it. If you're, out on, if you're listening to us on television and you still have speakers... Keep going with us, okay? I'm going to keep going. Maybe. Look at Jeremiah. Not only that, did my parents uh, allow me to, to have a fringe jacket. 
which they searched all over the world for. But you know where they found it? They found it in Rutherford, Tennessee. It's coming out of this monitor right here, this monitor. And uh, my dad used to take me every weekend, almost it seemed like, to Rutherford, Tennessee, where they found the jacket to go to Davy Crockett's log cabin, right? I've taken my kids up there. Still a thrill for me. But I think he got tired of taking me, so they had my uncle, who was a carpenter, and my grandfather, who was a carpenter, and they built me a faux log cabin in the backyard. There I am. You can tell how thrilled I am looking, right? Don't I look happy? Yeah. Well, you had to be tough if you're going to be Davy Crockett, right? Uh, I kind of got that when I was a kid. If the Harrises were here and some of the people that grew up with me, they'd tell you I was kind of tough. I mean, you, I mean, you just tell by my build today. So I had to soften my appearance a little bit. And, you know, David Crockett always had a sidekick. So I thought, well, I've got to be, I don't want the neighborhood kids running in fear for me. I mean, the way I look. So I employed a sidekick. There it is. That's Tiffany, my cat growing up. There's my coonskin cat. Uh, and Tiffany was a boy, but we won't get into that story, how he was named a girl's name. It, it really had nothing to do with modern changes in society. It was an accident. You know, one week my grandfather said, hey, that's a girl. We named her Tiffany. Came back a month later. He said, whoop, that's a boy. So Tiffany stuck. It was the toughest cat you ever met. I promise you that. My sidekick. A lot tougher than I was. I remember watching uh, that Davy Crockett movie that so inspired me uh, to want to wanna follow in his footsteps and, and play along with his life. I remember watching it so clearly that when I thought about these passages of Scripture, I remembered how the movie began. It began in the life of Davy Crockett when he was in the Creek Indian Wars, the Creek Wars. And, and it showed a, a fort, Fort Nims. And on that map, which was a, is a beautifully illustrated cartoon map for, from Walt Disney, as they begin to tell the story and sing the, the song in the background about David Crockett's adventures in the Creek War, you, you see a, an arrow speeding toward the map, and it hits the map, and suddenly that map begins to burn on the edges. When I was a kid, that man, I can't imagine living in a time like that. And I still remember it very clearly. I never thought, though, I'd live in a time when it seemed like our map was burning at the edges. I never envisioned that one day when people look on the period of my life in which I live, that a map like that actually may be how they remember it. Never thought I'd see the day. No, it's not the only days those have happened. In the story of Genesis 18, Abraham and Sarah, some 24 years before, had left their life, basically, which would have been of old age even then, to pursue this promise that a then 89-year-old woman, in chapter 18, would become a mother. I don't know of any 89-year-old woman signing up for that these days. They'd waited 24 years for this to happen. And it hadn't happened yet. Abraham had been blessed, though. He had become wealthy beyond measure. Now, in the ancient world, yes, wealth was, uh, was measured in money and gold and silver, but it was also measured in herds. In fact, Abraham had almost become a nation unto himself. His nephew Lot, who goes on this journey to the promised land and to pursue the promise of the seed that will come from him, is blessed too. And they, they become so great that they have to divide up. At one point, Lot is taken captive. And Abraham is so powerful, he has 318 soldiers who live with him. He's basically a nation. But he's a nation with no promised child. He's blessed, but he hasn't received the promise that made Abraham go on that journey. By the time we get to Genesis 18, Lot 
then Abraham will become so powerful and so numerous they've separated ways, as I said. Abraham lives in the promised land, Canaan. Does anybody remember where Lot moved to? To Sodom. He moved to Sodom. In our passage, as these three visitors came, in our early passage in Genesis 18, the three visitors who came to visit Abraham, Abraham immediately recognized these aren't people out in the wilderness traveling. He knows that it's God. And he knows if God is showing up, a promise must be coming with him. And indeed, it was coming with God. God had said, in due season, in other words, on the horizon is the birth of your child that you've waited nearly a quarter of a century for. It is going to happen. I mean, I get hungry waiting in line at Chick-fil-A, the drive through line, right? I get impatient with that. The patriarch and matriarch of, of our faith have waited 24 years. Abraham believes the promise. And Sarah, like any logical person would have, and said, now in my old age, are you really going to bless me with this? You're crazy. She's listening behind the door of the tent. Abraham was trying to believe a promise. And Sarah was struggling to believe it too. Because she knew that that map of her life had long ago turned to ashes. Sometimes faith requires us to look beyond fact, the facts that we know. Interestingly enough, this passage of Scripture, which is uh, indeed just predicates and follows right after um, Lot has been rescued, and then following it, the promise of a child-to-be, which will be confirmed in about a year in their life. But the context is greater if you read the entire story. In fact, it's fascinating that these three persons who are God, they leave this time of promise, and the Scriptures say they move directly to another place. And you follow the story. God travels to Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, Lot was, right? And what is God going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah? He's going to destroy it. And Abraham goes with him, travels with him, and begins uh, to negotiate, right? He knows his... His nephew is there. He doesn't want him to die. And he begins to, to negotiate for Sodom and Gomorrah. You can read the greater story, but the Scriptures tell us that Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be judged by God because it has committed grave sin, is the quote. Grave sin. And it's a great story because angels, those, these, these messengers from God, God's presence, it appears that one of them is the Lord, and two of them might have been angels. We don't know for sure. But they go, and they rescue Lot, don't they? And then, what happens to Sodom and Gomorrah? Is destroyed by fire and brimstone. And unfortunately, Lot's wife desires to go back, and she is what? turned into a pillar of salt. It's a good story. You should read it if you haven't. So not only did Abraham and Sarah receive the promise of this child that was to come when the map of their life was basically burned on the edges, right? It was ashes and dust. The world around them was being consumed by ashes and dust. And it wasn't just a regular promise like you're going to have a child. We know, and I've mentioned this several times, and I think it's important for us to remember, Paul believed that Abraham understood it wouldn't just be a child. It would be the child, the Son of God, who would become human, who would save us 
He understood the promise was greater. It had eternal significance. Isn't it amazing? In a moment of heavenly judgment on a sophisticated society that in the backwater, a shepherd, Abraham, is receiving, receiving a promise that will change the world. God was doing something in the middle of the chaos that had implications for all of history. In Matthew 9, we, we heard what Jesus said. Right? He told the disciples to go out in the world because there was a harvest to be had. There weren't enough workers for the harvest, but there was a harvest to be had. He said, go out and heal. He said, go out and raise the dead. He said, go out and cast out demons. Right? He said, touch the lepers and make them clean. Did you notice, though, when I read that passage of Scripture, where Jesus sent his disciples? He sent them home. He didn't send them to Samaria. He didn't send them to the other Gentile world around them, which were known for practices much like that that happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't send them to them. He didn't send them at first to the Roman government who were known for worshiping many gods, and especially a human, Caesar. He didn't do that. He first sent them home. And trust me, the Israelites' world around them was ablaze. Constantly they fought for their existence. The religious people of the day were fighting against the culture of the Romans. They could have been exterminated at any moment by the Roman Empire, the most powerful empire in the world. Their map was smoking. But Jesus said, go home and preach to your brothers and sisters. Every significant change in history has started where? In a home. Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah. Isaac was the seed that would create the Jewish race as we know it. Jesus came and was born in what? A home to Joseph and to Mary. The most significant actions in the world start in a household. Period. Even when the world around us seems to be ablaze, when it seems like we're in a midst of a cultural transformation that may be good, that may be bad, it will improve some things, but it may desecrate other things. Things too great for us to comprehend, too great for us to change in a political perspective. But the one thing we can do is remember the message Jesus gave the disciples. Get it right at home. He sent them to his own brothers and sisters to show them the one thing that we need to remember. God is always doing mighty works. In the midst of the chaos, he doesn't stop. In the midst of our fear, he doesn't stop being God. He doesn't stop being good. He doesn't stop being powerful. He doesn't stop transformation. He never does, and he never will. Because that's who God is. Do you remember what God said to Abraham? He said, why did Sarah laugh? And God says this, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord to do in this season? In the darkness that we feel, can he not make beauty? Of course he can. And I promise you, he is doing it. He's doing it. 
Our map may go up in smoke, but God's promise is eternal. We may have to wait a quarter of a century. We may have to only wait a moment. But we can trust this. In the midst of judgment, God is always bringing blessing. And He always will. He always has. As the musicians come forward, Perhaps if you're like me, there are moments when you, uh, there are moments when you probably check out. Do you ever do that? I'm not getting on Facebook. I'm not getting on social media. I'm not watching the news because it makes me focus too much on the chaos and not enough on the Savior. This morning, if you're watching, I invite you to remember that in the midst of every tribulation, there will come a blessing. God is still working for our good, for the good of our world, and for all of our brothers and sisters. I pray we may be open to receive it and never think anything is too wonderful for God. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him will live forever. waiting there with hope and arms for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever the power
afflictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loves the world. Again, thank you for joining us this morning. Look forward to seeing you next week in person if you'd like to join us. If you would let us know if you're planning on coming, we've got most everyone's responses, so we have a pretty full house based on our limited seating capacity due to social distancing, but we're going to make it work. So we're grateful for you uh, responding to that, and if you haven't responded yet, you'd like to come either to 815 or 1050. Unless we get a surge of numbers, we'll only have two services this next week. Uh, please just let us know if you plan on coming, if you haven't already done so. Most of you have, so you're good, and you'll be getting an email early uh, this week to go ahead and sign up for the 28th. On the 28th, uh, we're going to have, um, we, we actually got lucky and got a guy to come in to preach. I'm going to be on vacation, the first time I've been on vacation in a year. Imagine that, just once a year I go on vacation. I like to go four or five times, but once is usually all I go. Uh, he's coming in from, uh, he's just coming in, be here a few days. He travels the world preaching, so we're going to be really blessed to have him with us. His name's Brett Buckland, also our youth minister. Uh, he's usually uh, half of the week he travels, so I promise he'll do a great job. He'll be with us on the 28th, so next week I'll be here to kick things off and excited to do so. So look for that email concerning the 28th and your intention to come on that day. We're going to try to stay a week ahead for planning purposes. Again, thank you for joining us online, and remember, indeed, we do serve a God whose love is amazing and continues on every season of our life. May the Lord God bless each of you, and may you receive his mercy, his strength, his honor, and his love, that indeed you may know, that you may trust, and that you may go out into the world and to be his power, to be his healing, and to be his mercy to the world around us. Go in that blessing and return in his peace. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever. Jesus is waiting, God.